There we go. Yes. Welcome back to Money Mindset Mentors. We are so excited to be able to talk with you today about a topic that we all find very fascinating. And it is this idea of a sprint or a marathon. And what is it when we're talking about money or investment? Are we entering a sprint or are we entering a marathon? And what are the myths behind that? And how do we tackle those so that that way we can enter anything with money, right? Whether it's changing our money game or whether it's jumping into the land of investment. How can we do that at the appro appropriate pace to where we are not getting nervous and wanting to jump ship when things are not going right? That is what we're going to be talking about today. So let's go ahead and start with Amy. Do you want to take it away and answer that question? How do we make sure that we are running the right race when it comes to investment? Investments. That's it's a great question, uh, and we like we were talking about um, a little bit earlier in prep for this was just kind of like more recently. I feel like uh, we've started working. I have started working with uh, some clients who uh, you know maybe listening to like other podcasts. So my specialty is obviously going to be in the real estate uh, market and that type of investing. Uh, we do other types of investing too, but certainly uh, my expertise lies in the in the real estate realm. Um, and just more recently, I think you have to be able to adapt to the changes that are happening uh, around us. Um, certainly, we started investing back in 2006, and the market was much, much different then. So uh, you have to just uh, understand that the market is going to change over time. But I have to tell you, when we started investing, it felt very uh, expensive then, right? So we bought our first property for $140,000 um, and that felt very expensive for our market. It was pushing our budget, we were young uh, and we just weren't sure like what it was gonna rent for. We knew we had to put some work into it. So it felt very expensive. So I just like to people to keep in mind, they're like, oh my gosh, $140,000 if I could get something like that for today, right? But like then it felt very expensive. And I'll be honest, every time I buy a property, it feels very expensive, <laughs> feels very expensive. So uh, we just recently bought an eight plex uh, and the numbers were very, very tight on that. And it felt very expensive. Last year we bought a six plex the, the numbers were very, very tight. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. And then I always look back, you know what I mean? So I look back at the properties, you know, that we bought, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And I'm like, man, I should have bought two of those. You know what I mean? But at the time they feel very expensive. So I think that's kind of just what we're feeling uh, right now uh, with the changes that have happened recently in the market. We have, uh, it, very high interest rates that are making purchase prices come down a little bit, um, but honestly, not. Uh, it's still is still very expensive. Like it's especially in Utah. Utah's a, a tight market. It's tough because there's just a lot of great economics that continue to help our state run really well and very efficiently. Um, and I think a lot of people can see that it's a good place. So the marathon for me. And to like explain to people is just that it always feels. For me, at least, over my course of investments through years and years, it's just, it has, it's just felt very expensive every time we've bought a property. And we've bought properties, um, you know, for years and years and years. We're at least buying one a year most of the time, too. And it just always feels expensive for what the market is. So I just think keeping in mind, if you turn around now and say, okay, cool, we paid $140,000 for that property and we're, you know, a bunch of years in. But now that property is worth um, probably triple what we paid for it, right? Maybe not quite triple. Um, but the, the reality of that situation is the magic for specifically real estate investing. Um, if, you know, and like I said, there's a lot of other types of investing and it's great to be diversified. You know, if you want T-bills and maybe own a business or two businesses, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but specifically in the real estate market, um, you, the magic is not your cash flow number usually. So the magic of real estate for me, uh, certainly that cash flow number does start to be magic as you grow. Um, but certainly it's not 
usually magic to begin with. You know what I mean? Like it's the magic of real estate is your loan paid out and the interest write off and the depreciation and the appreciation. So there's so many benefits of real estate. And a lot of times it's difficult to wrap your brain around the other aspects of real estate that are actually benefiting you. So it's a long-winded answer. You know, I love that you, that you humanize that feeling of it feels heavy. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. feels heavy. And I think as we're talking about sprinting and marathons, right? A marathon to me feels heavy when I'm not a runner. And yeah. when I think about a marathon, I'm like, oh, that does feel heavy. Um, um, Rachel, go ahead. Um, yeah. So, and just kind of keeping it real, like the telephone rang and so at the fizz shop. So, uh, yeah. Um, but going along with what Amy said, I mean, it's so interesting. You know, we always hear hindsight is 2020. So when Amy is talking about her purchases back in 2006 and 2007, and how she was like, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. But if you listen to her answer, she also said that now that's tripled, right? So let's use that as well when we're purchasing our real estate or we're, you know, taking a look at real estate right now to thinking about investing. And in our minds, we're like, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. I want prices that were like 2006. Well, hey, we got to back up a minute and we've got to say, hey, when we purchased in 2006, now let's look now that that property is tripled right so most likely hopefully if the cycle continues we'll be in that same boat and so having that kind of a mindset you can't just pick what pieces out of the puzzle you want you know you kind of have to look at history as it is um speaking of history we and amy can attest to this but we have just come out of like the the highest or the longest upswing in real estate prices like it's just beginning or has begun, just depending on where you are, has begun to drop. And we, we are seeing those prices drop, kind of like Amy said, like a little bit of a bump down because of interest rates. However, our prices are not going to be coming down to where they were. I mean, there might be some places like, you know, depending on where, where you're looking or where you're at. Um, I'm not going to say that every house is going to keep that appreciation, but I'll tell you, if you're, if you're looking in a place like that, you don't want to, that's not a place you want to invest. Um, and so, yeah, just, I mean, taking this, the sprint approach versus the marathon approach, like as you're thinking about, um, purchasing real estate for investments, it is definitely not an emotional game. Mm -hmm. So you got to set your game up and you, like, if you need to, you can have someone else, like, look at your numbers or look at, like, if you want to check on things regularly and that's too emotional for you, have someone else that you trust, look at things to make sure it's going Okay. But, you know, it's not something that you're just like, hey, I'm out, unless something, you know, unless it's really well thought out. Don't lead with emotion. Agreed. Another point to that is certain, so we bought in 2006, and if everybody remembers, 2008 was like big, huge crisis, right? So if we were in a situation where we needed to sell at that point, we certainly would have lost money. So I think that goes along with the marathon and setting yourself up right um, and honestly, we didn't know, I mean, nobody in our family invests and we didn't know anybody at that time that invested. And so I think we really just got lucky on our first one and we learned, um, but, but realistically, like the market dropped, like we paid 140,000 and two, three years later, that property was probably worth 90, you know, um, our taxes went down on it, everything, you know what I mean? So uh, I think if we had been in a position where we had to sell that property, um, it would have been a different story. So I think that goes along with set, like what you said, um, you know, Rachel, setting yourself up and helping some, and like having somebody that helps you with numbers. So for specifically talking about real estate, real estate is absolutely a marathon. It is not a sprint. Um, and so if you are looking at your numbers and making sure, okay, you know, like I've accounted for taxes and insurance, um, you know, I've accounted for, you know, PMI, if you're going to have PMI, if you're going to be putting less than 20% down, I've accounted for like my capital expenses, anything that's big, like roofs and water heaters and HVAC systems. Uh, you know, if we're, if we're accounting for small things, you know, like cleaning and maintenance type items, like my blinds broke, but the tenant didn't break them. They just wore out, you know, like just little things. So if we've accounted for all of those, you shouldn't get yourself into a position financially where that property is draining you. 
And so if you set yourself up correctly, it can be a marathon um, and it can be sustainable for a good, good long time. So, yeah. And yeah. you know, it reminds me, and you two are talking, it reminds me of something that I learned through Ramsey Solutions. And as we talked about investments, no matter what it is in real estate, whether it's in the stock market, they talk about how so many people, it's like riding a roller coaster and you get on this roller coaster and the that you hit the drop, everybody wants to jump out of the cart. Everybody just wants to get off of the ride as fast as they can. Instead of realizing that this is part of investing, it is, you have to write out the market. And so you write it out. And then I love when Jade says, you don't lose any money unless you sell when it's bad. You don't lose anything. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yep. and so I just love that thought of when you are looking at an investment, it is not a quick, you're not looking to make a quick OR, um, ROI. You're looking at over time. You're mm -hmm. looking at what is this going to do for me in 10 years? What is this going to do for me in 15 years? Mm -hmm. What is this going to do for me when I'm ready to retire? You're looking at it as that type of an investment instead of, a cash flow investment right now. Which is difficult sometimes, right? Like, because everybody's in a different spot in investing. Like I work with all kinds of investors. I work with investors that come in and pay cash for four townhomes at a time. I work with investors that have to own or occupy that thing for a year before they can move out and hopefully be able to break even on a property. So you have to also like take into account, like there's a lot of different types of people that are investing and you have to do something that works for you. And for a new, young, small, maybe not young, new <laughs> investors, that is a super hard thing to wrap your brain around, which I totally understand. It's a super difficult thing to wrap your brain around all of the, uh, around all of the benefits of real estate that are not going to benefit you right away. Right. Because if you're listening to some other podcasts, you know, like, I don't know if I could say like some of the other big podcasts that are out there right now, they're just like, oh, you know, like you have to make all this money, all this, you know, like it has to be this, it has to be this, or otherwise it's not a good investment. And I think sometimes for a new investor, that cash flow number is important. It's very important because they feel uh, like that's what's going to help them to, you know, make the next purchase, which is totally, that's totally right. You know, like a lot of times, but that $100 a month that you're going to make, even if you're making $200 a month, which is pretty unrealistic, but like if, even if it's, if you're making that, that $200 a month is not, or should not be what's going to make or break that investment for you. You know what I mean? And I always think that a, that an investment should be positive. You know, like, I don't think that people should, well, there's specific situations in which you would, right? Like sometimes right now in the market, our owner occupies when they're putting 5% down, it's pretty stinking difficult to make those things even break even on the other side if they're planning on leaving in one year, right? Because we're going to kind of assume that the market is going to change a little bit, right? And based on past experience, we can say that rents have gone up this percent. But for example, rents went up 12 to 15 percent last year. And this year, we've been able to go up between one and three, right? So you can guess you know, what you think the market is going to do, but you just don't know. And so um, if you're only planning on, you know, one year and breaking even on the other side of it, that, that there still may be a good spot for you to invest, even if it's not a cash flow positive position. But with that being said, most of the time I do recommend it. It's cash flow positive. <laughs> I mean, like there just has to be like some give and take on that right now where we're at in the market. So and Absolutely. I think that's why it's so important to make sure those numbers work for you, mm -hmm. yeah. right? To run well, all of the numbers ahead of time. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and to work with somebody, if you're a new investor or even a seasoned investor, like mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with putting your head together with multiple people. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like in some of the markets that I'm in, actually we do, like it's a little bit different than Utah. We do actually see 1%, the 1% rule, sometimes the 2% 2, 2 rule. Um, so we're able to cash flow that. However, that comes with, you know, we're able to cash flow, but then does the appreciation go up on those properties? And so you really want to be working with someone who understands those things because, okay, are you wanting that cash flow? Do you need, um, you know, I've got a property that does cash flow pretty well. Um, we actually, we bring in $800 a month from it. 
um, and bought that property just what is it right at COVID. So what are we May of 2020? So almost three years ago. And from day one after rehab, um, we are able to cash flow that pretty decently. But it's in a market where appreciation is not happening like some of the other places or a lot of the other places. Mm-hmm. So you want to work with someone that understands that, you know, the difference between cash flow and appreciation and what are your goals and like owner occupied, like Amy talks about, like, you know, it's so important not to just jump on the bandwagon because someone else is doing something. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And that's a great point too. Like mm-hmm. other markets, a lot of times when I talk to first time investors, if they have 20% down and they're not going to owner occupy, a lot of times I very upfront and say, maybe Utah's not your market for this first one, right? Like Utah yeah. might not be your market. Like there are other mar- there's other markets. Like we hold properties just in other markets, you know what I mean? As well. So we have properties in Florida and properties in Arizona and properties in Idaho. And those types, those properties are better cash flow. You know, yes. And they're also for, for us or for my experience have carry a little higher risk. My turns cost me a little bit more on those properties because tenant, the tenant base is a little different. So I think you know, it's a little bit of a balance, but I think when you have a new investor that can put 20% down, a lot of times those people that I talk to, I'm like, Hey, Utah might not be your market. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Utah just might not be it. It's an expensive market. It's tough to get into. So if they're not owner occupied, I think that's a great point. Like there's other markets out there that, that do cash flow better. So. And one thing that I would love for you guys to go a little deeper in is this 1% rule, if you don't mind, there may be some people out there that may be going, what in the world is a 1% oh, rule? Yeah. Rachel, you can take that. It's one. Yeah. It's, yeah. You go ahead. You go ahead. 1%. So the rent. So I'm going to give you a really easy example. $100,000. You're going to rent for $1,000 a month. So you're equal to the, the, one percent of the purchase price and that usually gives you a really great buffer um for uh all of the expenses that we talked about right like your taxes insurance capital expenditures cleaning and maintenance items pmi like all of those things um that usually gives you a really good buffer um for those for those types of properties i haven't yeah. seen the one percent rule in utah since 2014. <laughs> Yeah, it's to give you an idea. Hard. Yeah. And we didn't I, even meet the one percent rule. So I bought a property in 2014 for 169. And the we lived in it first. And the first time we rented that, we we rented it out for 1400 a month. So the Utah's always been a tricky market for the one percent rule. But yes, the one percent yeah. rule. So two percent would be amazing, right? Like two percent, yeah. you're probably in a risky area though, right? Like you're probably well, you trading, are. you're probably you trading are. something, but you yeah. definitely are like um. I mean, we definitely have had really good luck with all of our tenants. I can't say that, you know, knock on wood, but, um, you know, and we, we self-manage them. And so it's been really easy for us. However, I think that also using the 1% rule is also super helpful if you're looking at a prop, uh, property, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to offer on this property or not. So if you can quickly use that rule of thumb, you'll mm-hmm. know, okay, is this, is this worth my time? And then you're right. not spending so much time doing all the research, you know? So that's yeah. a quick, quick way to get in. Then if you do have an offer that's accepted or whatever, then you dig deeper. You dig deeper and say, okay, like now that I'm in here, now that, you know, I can see all the, the problems and, and have your inspection or whatever it is, then you're able to kind of go, like I said, go deeper and see if that really even makes sense. Like, does it need okay. a ton of work? Is totally. the foundation falling apart, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. So. Totally. And that, and it's an easy way to use it any market, right? So you can say, Hey, what, like if, if somebody's exploring a lot of different markets in real estate, a great question to ask real estate agents is what is that rule for you? Like, Mm -hmm. where does your market lie? Cause here in Utah, we're about 0.5. So 0.5, 0.6, that's pretty average for us. But like, you know what I mean? Like other markets, my Florida properties certainly meet the 1% rule. You know, like it just, it's a very easy way to say, okay, this market is probably a better cash flow market than this market, you know? So certainly, yeah. yeah. It's kind of fun. It's so, it it's, it's so, you know? yeah. yeah. Cause it's like, yeah. oh, you have these rules and, you know, yeah. and they, and they're so helpful. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just, you know, it seems like, especially when you're talking about a sprint or a marathon, like Amanda, and you're like, oh my gosh, I think about a marathon and I like die. I didn't think about that because I, in years past have run several marathons. And so I'm like, oh, whatever, you just do it, right? 
But then I thought, wait, we should probably change that and not call it a sprint or a marathon (laughs) because that's overwhelming. That's like a thought that nobody wants to think about. So anyone has any better suggestions between sprint and marathon? Like I am so for that. Me too. Yeah. 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 We will definitely play on those words. (laughs) Yes. Even a sprint though, I'm going to be honest, anything that involves running (laughs) makes me want to fall over purely (laughs) exhausted. I love it. Um, all right. Well, thank you ladies so much. I just want to share a couple of takeaways that I had, and I would love to know if you guys had any as well. A few takeaways that I have is remembering that we want, that we're in it for the long call, that it's not something that's a quick, if I'm not making money right off the bat from an investment, it doesn't need to make me, it doesn't need to cause me panic. It's okay. I can write it out. And then I love the idea of knowing the 1% rule, talking to somebody who knows about the market in the area. So that way you can quickly ask. And I love that just being a quick measuring stick of, is this investment doable for me? Is this something that I can do and being able to make that decision really quickly? I love the idea of that. Anything that you ladies had as takeaways? I would say like when you were talking, I was thinking of the buddy system, you know, like um, you're always doing something with a buddy and not that you have to invest with somebody, but like always have it in your brain. Like before you make a snap decision, reach out to that person. Like we talked about earlier that you trust so that you can keep your investment sound and you're not making a silly mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say that's a great point. And emotional, I think when you're talking purely for an emotional invest, like purely for an investment, the emotions They just have to come out of it, which is super hard at the beginning. So if you are a newer investor, it's a difficult thing to do without emotion. Um, So I think your buddy system is helpful. Even, you know, they like just have somebody that knows how to run numbers, how to verify rents, how to like really say, yeah, this is probably the most realistic viewpoint. And then make sure that you stress those numbers out both ways. It's good to look at like the potential income that would benefit you and then also numbers that look equally as awful if you stress them the other way you know like best case scenario worst case scenario and then prob- probability um and then yeah that just helps people to make like a good choice like a much better choice in their in their lives so can i say something really fast that i love about yeah. what amy just said so she talked about like your best case and your worst case that's something that we always talk about with our kids and stuff what is the worst thing mm-hmm. that could happen And so, okay, if you're going to lose that property, is that the worst thing that's going to happen? Is that going to kill you? Like, is that going to really devastate you? And maybe it will. And so that's a decision you have to make, but maybe it won't. Mm -hmm. And so really understanding that worst case scenario. So when your mind goes crazy, you're like, okay, I'm fine. We already went through this. I'm fine. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And just so all of you out there that are listening or watching this on Facebook, we are right here to help you guys. If you have any questions, particular, particularly to what we've discussed today, please, please, please put them in the comments below so we can make sure that we are addressing your concerns and helping you as you are getting ready to take these next steps in becoming more savvy with your money and be able and being able to start to invest. We are so excited to help you guys in any way that we can, and we will see you guys next month. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.